Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Veg Networking Canada. It is important for all of us to honor, acknowledge, and respect that many of us are located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of many Indigenous peoples of Canada. Welcome again. Veg Networking Canada is a community where vegan plant-based companies connect and collaborate. Today, we have a special guest who is a three-time nine-figure exit entrepreneur a world-class mentor and investor to many around the world, an award-winning keynote speaker and podcast host, an Amazon best-selling author, all with a passion for family, community, and holistic health. Veg Networking Canada is pleased to introduce the CEO of Fata & Associates. Welcome, Mike Fata. Thanks. Thanks for having me and the uh, warm welcome. Thank you so much. We're happy to have you here. Can you tell everybody listening a little bit more about your own vegan plant-based origin story as it relates to Manitoba Harvest and much of your investment portfolio? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it my health journey started with uh, you know hitting my rock bottom at 18 years old and weighing 300 pounds and then trying different diets and lifestyles um, as I started working out and exercising and playing with food. Um, and that led me to... Um, starting Manitoba Harvest, which uh, we founded in 1998 and really helped pioneer the hemp food movement uh, with hemp hearts and other products and successfully grew that business over the last, well, for 21 years. And then um, four years ago, uh, sold the company to the largest cannabis company in the world. And uh, since then, I've been investing in uh, mentoring and advising other founders in the natural product space, um, all of which are uh, offering what I believe to be world class, but uh, world class plant based products, and um, uh, and Soul Cuisine would have been the one that uh, um, we we sold the business, uh, exited the business uh, last year. But um, there's another nine in my portfolio. And in terms of the vegan plant based part, like why as an investor who could invest in anything, like why does that speak to you? Why is that important to you? Or is it just happenstance? That's important. I, I mean, I, um, so I'm not, uh, I'm not a vegan or hundred percent plant-based, um, uh, right now. Um, uh, I have been a vegetarian and a vegan throughout my health journey. Um, if, if, if people ask me to qualify and diet, I'd say I'm a qualitarian. Um, and so, you know, I eat mostly a Mediterranean diet, predominantly fruits and vegetables. Um, um, but some some uh, animal products and and uh, support organic agriculture uh, uh, for a long time. Um, as it relates to you know investing in in companies, um, I don't know. It, it was part you know use nuts for cheese for an example. And you said you had Margaret on the uh, on the show. Um, I never really liked cheese because it didn't make me feel good eating it. Um, and so, but I didn't really hadn't met a plant based cheese that I fell in love with until I met Margaret and tried nuts for cheese and. It was a no-brainer for me. I kept adding it to the grocery list for my house, and and then met Margaret, and uh, and and realized just how awesome of a founder she was. And, and it made no, it, it, when she asked me, "Hey, do you want to help me grow the business to the next level?" It was a no-brainer for me to invest in and also um, start mentoring her, but now uh, chair her board of directors and and really help her with the governance of the company. Incredible. Now, in terms of your entrepreneur origin story, did it did that actually start and begin with Manitoba Harvest, or was there something before? How did that unfold? Yeah, it's. I mean, I feel like I've been a I've been a born entrepreneur, growing up with a, a single mom and a poor family, always thinking about how do I make money, and and so I, I left school when I was fourteen and I started working, um, but I was working for other people, uh, mostly in the construction industry, and so Manitoba Harvest was my first formal business that I uh, that I had started, um, and uh, and really without a formal education, it was all just self taught. Like how do we how do we start this not only company but start a new industry. And speaking of starting it yourself, um, from not coming from that area or that arena, did you yourself have mentors at that time when you started that? Or, uh, yeah, well, my mom was my biggest mentor from the beginning. You know, she was in she was in the uh, worked in retail, so worked at Shoppers Drug Mart, and and um, so when I was starting a consumer packaged goods company, she had a lot of value to add to and and show me how to start a business. But there was other, two other co-founders of Manitoba Harvest, uh, Martin and Alex, that um, had been working on hemp and getting hemp legal for a number of years before that. 
And so we kind of combined that they had a background uh, of, of a starting up in pioneering hemp. And I came from my health changes and a, and a super high interest in, in all healthy things and knew that hemp parts and hemp oil, just um, even though people didn't know about it and there was a new industry that there was going to be a huge demand that we could build over time. Wonderful. Now you might answer this question from what you have going on with your mentorship leadership part of the business or and or speaking to it from the CPG lens. But the next question is, what are some transformations or trends in your industry? Yeah, I think that um, two ways I would think about it. And some of this, the pandemic really, um, really intensified, but need states are, are one way of and, and there's so there's, there's trends based around kind of need states, you know, energy being one of them. Um, relaxation being another one. Uh, you know, whether that's relaxing or, or, or kind of sleep. Um, um, I think, uh, uh, digestion and, and kind of, uh, all that surrounds the kind of microbiome and, and metabolics is, is another kind of neat state that's waking up. Um, and then maybe more specific to product. I think that consumers, especially the health, healthy minded consumers, which is more turning that way, uh, more simple ingredient foods, um, more like you'd make it at home, but you want the comfort of actually about being able to buy the product in the store because of limited time or whatever. But like, um, you know, not not reading a label that has like thirty ingredients when it could be made with like seven or eight ingredients and still just be as a high quality, um, tasty product. I'd see I see those two kind of combining together. So if you can give a consumer satisfy the kind of need states with with this healthy, cleaner label, um, and 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 you know, backed by kind of the, the quality of trust. So whether that's food safety and, and quality, um, you know, plant-based in, in, in their organic and non-GMO, these kind of benefits to consumers as well. I think, I think that's all um, shaping some of the products that we're seeing that are breakout products right now in the marketplace. Yeah. And I think a lot of myself and probably a lot of people listening uh, that term need state and the way that you kind of went deeper into like energy and relaxation like, totally makes sense. And that that's so thank you for that. That's a, I know some founders are going to be listening to that and I probably popped out for them really focusing on need states. So that's interesting. Now, in terms of the future uh, for FATA and Associates, do you want to like walk people through like what FATA and Associates, how it started, where, it, where you got to today and then where that's going to go in the future? Yeah, I mean, quite simply, Fat and Associates is just is 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 my family fund and and family office, and so it could be named anything. Uh, maybe maybe the name name will change. Uh, Fat and Associates because I had a good mentor and and uh, and and he um, his his name was Southworth and Associates, and I was like, okay, if you're going to represent yourself and your family office, but it could be Fat of Family Ventures or Fat of Family Fun. Uh, um, but it, it, it is, uh, it, it is our small family office and, and then the work that I do not only from investment, but, uh, some of the other ways that I help entrepreneurs, if it's an advisor or board member or, or growth coach, um, my book, some of my other things all run through the uh, company. Um, and, uh, but maybe it's time that there's a sexier name for it or something. Awesome. And we'll, we'll touch on, cause we have a question about resources. And, uh, when I was thinking about this conversation, it was interesting because I was looking at some of the things about resources, books, podcasts, websites, and things like that. So you're going to have a lot to speak on with your own, but for right now, uh, do you want to touch on, uh, the conversation about giving back and charity? Like, what does that mean to you? Do you do that in your own professional life? Do you give back? What does that look like for you? Yeah, uh, I feel like I've built my success off of giving back. And I, I talk a lot about it in the book because I, I believe it's a principle that a lot of not only entrepreneurs, but but people in their business or career or, or entrepreneurship can really use to um, to be a catalyst for growth is is, is they're giving back. And so I, I my I've always aligned with my passion. So at first it was like volunteering and and um, and spending a lot of time helping at a larger level, like industry level, you know, being involved in, and chairing the hemp industry association. Um, and then I ran the organic trade association on their board for six years. And then my most recent was the Canadian health food association, uh, for six years on, on, on the board and, and like really helping these national organizations, um, to, to grow and, and prosper so they can have a bigger benefit, um, to the industry. Um, and so I, I, 
I just kind of completed last year, 25 years of nonprofit volunteer work and, and decided that it was time to take a year or two to think about what I wanted to do next. But um, that's kind of, that's an example before kind of getting into the more specific, like mentoring and, and the time that I spend there, my impact at, uh, it, uh, in, in a larger sense to try to make this world a healthier place. And touching off on that, do you have any favorite charities that like from like a monetary standpoint that you've loved to support throughout your throughout your life? Anything that's meaningful to you that you want to kind of give a shout out to or no? Yeah, for sure. I'd give a shout out to uh, to Community Food Centers of Canada. Um, I think they're they're making an impact uh, and we've uh, been a supporter, um, you know, and and and, and some smaller sense in uh, regionally, too, on 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 some of the initiatives around Manitoba. But I could tell you that um, you know the far majority of my time, or or the investment that I've made in in, uh, in philanthropy and and charity is is with my time, and because uh, time is very valuable, um, and and I know it feels good for me to do that, uh, and I can make an impact um, um, that way personally, uh, and show my kids that. So uh, more of my time has been there, and uh, than than just doing uh, uh, you know in, investments into these charities. Yeah, totally. Now, for the founders listening who perked up when you started talking about board of directors and everything like that, because that's a common question that you see a lot in the founder space is like, how do I go about looking and what do I look for? Do you have any just like concise tips or points for those people listening that are definitely wondering more about that? Yeah, well, I'd say we it's one of the resource sections in fatafleischman.org. So if, if they're not already familiar with, and hopefully you guys can drop it in the show notes, but our Greg Fleischman and I's give back project uh, project where you can there all the forms, tools, and templates to grow your business as an entrepreneur are there. One of them is around governance, uh, and we have a whole folder and section on it um, because before you go kind of searching for people, it, it's important to say like, what am I looking for? And, and a big difference where depending on where you are in your in your career, uh, if if you're not owning the business uh, or or if you are an entrepreneur, um, on like you know, what do you, what do you need help with? And that starts usually with the SWOT analysis of understanding your strengths and weaknesses. And then you could, then you could define, you know, I could tell you that my mentors and, and, and which ultimately came some of my board members were subject matters in, uh, experts in, in one department of business. So I had my sales mentor, my marketing operations and finance. And that's just the way I like to think about things and think about business and, and growth very much like in your personal life, you'd be thinking about your you know, your, your, your health and, and your family and, and, uh, and, and growth kind of that way structured up. But, um, for, for business, either one mentor could be all of that for someone like sales, marketing, ops, and finance, you could have separate, uh, mentors. Those mentors could be industry experts. They could be peer to peer. We're trying to develop and, and these mass mentorship tools. So it can go from like one to many, so people can learn on their own. Um, but ultimately if you're going to be an entrepreneur and you've chosen not, you know, to, to own and, and start a business, you, you need to be, you need to be really good across sales, marketing ops and finance. It's interesting the way that you broke, it sounded like at the beginning, you broke apart sales and marketing and then ops and finance, almost like people who might be listening who are in the restaurant business. It's like front of house, back of house. Is that? Is oh, that I do think of? about it like that for sure. Yeah. And especially at the senior leadership level, you'll find that, uh, and you could study like some of the greatest business of all time had to have had two people involved, whether they're two founders or, or as a CEO and a COO, but like someone going out and doing sales and marketing and covering that aspect of the business. Um, and then, and then someone back of the house, like finance and operations, um, I, I I came from a, I was naturally stronger naturally you know some of my talent was in finance because my mom was an accountant and, and operations I I always took a fascination to kind of how things work and how we could how we could build things from my sales and marketing anything that I've learned and everything I've done from sales and marketing as an entrepreneur has been uh, uh, taught and learned and kind of more forced even behavior for me because I'm naturally more an introvert I think introverts maybe fit more into those ops and finance roles but if you're in a if you're thinking about your sales and marketing hat on as an entrepreneur, you need to be your extrovert itself. And, uh, uh, and I've had to, to learn that, uh, maybe sometimes the hard way. <laughs> We're going to get into the last question, which is around advice and everything like that. But that, that right there is, is uh, going to resonate with a lot of people. So yeah, you talked about, uh, Fata and Fleischman, uh, as the website resource. Um, you have your own podcast, you have your own book. 
are there any, so feel free to please answer touching more on your own resources, but also we're curious to know somebody with your, you know, um, professional success, what resources outside of yourself, outside of the ones that you created have inspired you, whether that's books, documentaries, apps on your phone for leadership or mental health, who knows, but any resources of your own or others that you want to touch on more? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, if if for entrepreneurs that are listening, if you haven't already read Jim Collins' book, uh, Good to Great, um, that that's one that I think uh, really should absorb that and and think how you make your business better and continuously improve it to, to di differentiate yourself um, is is huge. Uh, you know, I, I give a lot of credit to the organizations that have have helped me because I know that the, you know nonprofit associations, whatever industry we're in, I, I'm obviously passionate about health and 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 organic and and was in the hemp business for a long time, and so those were the industry organizations. But you know, for someone that's interested in writing books, it could be the Authors Association or or you know, there's for home decor or whatever you're 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 interested in. But that's where you can really build community. Um, and learn a tremendous amount um, peer to peer and 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 from the experts that are in your space. So um, I, I when I dropped out of school at fourteen, I, I I learned this and thought, wow, um, you know, when going to school, you're signing up to learn from a, a certain amount of professors uh, and teachers. Um, but if you go on your own, uh, or even after you graduate from school, when you go on your own, you have to you have to seek out the professors and the teachers that you think you can you can learn something for for the right stage of your life and for the right stage of your career and and the best place to find that whether again whether it's a friend a peer or someone that becomes your mentor is 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 in the in the place that you're doing business together so hey if you're in the natural products industry you're at the CHFA uh, trade shows in Canada and Expo West and Expo East in the U.S. like that's your whole community right there and and if you're not in that space and you're in an adjacent uh, industry like what is it for your industry that's that's where i should that's why i would encourage people to be spending their time and building their community so you don't have to but now i'm curious as to the reason that you dropped out of school at 14 because a lot of people listening might be in post-secondary education and thinking like geez like this just isn't for me and they listen to this and they're like whoa he dropped out at 14 can you touch more on that or yeah, it's, it was two things combined. Like one, I've always I mentioned earlier, I grew up poor. And so I wanted to be able to make money to just buy things, buy buy clothes, buy fast food at that time, uh, buy cigarettes, unfortunately, because I smoked for too many years when I was a teenager, uh, but buy things. And, and and it was part, I wanted to earn money uh, and I couldn't do that when I was in school. And, and then the second part was, it, that was the start of my unhealthy uh, phase of, of, of being a teenager. And so I was the nerdy overweight kid and going into high school, high school was a big, just, I thought like I saw it as a social club and I didn't fit into that. So I'm like, well, if I don't do this, I can go and, and start working, even if it's hard work, which it was construction with a, with a shovel and a pickaxe. Um, but I, I, I own my own destiny and then I can, I can learn from there what I'm interested in. And I, I, Realize I have nothing against school, right? I, I actually, after 35 years, I went back uh, to university and got my director's uh, certification two years ago um, from the Institute of Corporate Directors. But I, you know, I'm not against school. I just know that it's not for everyone. So when I when I'm talking to entrepreneurs specifically, because a lot of entrepreneurs find that even if they start down the post secondary education path, sometimes they they find like midway through like something they're passionate about, they start a business, and then and then that that becomes the thing they want to learn and execute on every day. Well, make that leap, go for it, you know, um, because if you look at a lot of successful people in life, they've, 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 they've done that. So I, you know, I, I'm not the only one nowadays. It's not talking about like, there's not just one way to educate yourself and there's just not one path. Um, so you, you gotta just be mindful of what's right for you. And, and fortunately I, I, I came to that at 14 and, and my mom supported me when I told her, Hey, I don't want to go to school. She said, as long as you got a job, yeah, that's good. You know? And, uh, and away I went. Incredible, incredible. All right. It's apparent that your mom and the founders that you work with and community is all very much so like a deep, deep rooted source of inspiration for you. Um, so feel free to touch on any of that more. But that's the next question that we ask folks is, you know, and you might answer it like certain people or nature might be a source of inspiration for you, but others also kind of answer it from like what inspiration actually means from more from a philosophical sense. So long-winded way of saying like inspiration what does it mean to you where do you source it 
That's a great question. I like that one. Uh, I think that you know, like being inspired for me is being within my spirituality and, and, and I've, I've felt like my spirituality, um, I, I'm not religious. That's not my spirituality. My spirituality always feels like I'm, it's from, I'm connected with mother nature or the universe. Um, and so when I'm in, when I've been doing, you know, work on myself or spiritual practice or my meditations or yoga, I'm, I'm usually coming to that place where I feel like I have, um, mother nature's or the universe's energy, um, and, and limitlessness, uh, that I can tap into. And, and so, um, I just bring that back down into every day, what I'm doing and, and kind of hold that in a flow state. And, uh, and so I get that from people when I hang out with people, they're like, wow, you're firing me up. Like, where are you pulling that from? And I'm like, I'm just trying to be my best self. And, and this is me showing up as my best self in tune with, um, mother nature and some, and maybe that's, you know, Hey, I, I had the, I had the privilege of uh, being a, in boy Scouts when I was younger and spent a lot of time in the woods. And, and, and then when I became an adult, uh, especially when we got into the health business and, and, you know, health and, and natural and organic, it kind of led me literally back into the bush and, and, uh, and, uh, under the stars. And, and, and I think that's, we can all kind of learn from that because, you know, we're just this small speck on this rock that's going through outer space. Right. And, uh, uh, and if we keep that into perspective, anything's possible, you know, put your work towards it. Anything's possible. Now you and I had briefly chatted offline uh, a little bit ago about your meditation practice. Um, and you just mentioned it there. Um, it's really important to you and maybe there's others who could benefit from that side of wisdom that you, can you share a little bit more about that? What that looks like? Yeah. I mean, it started for me when I started my health practice. Um, so when I was in my early twenties, um, I, I, I somehow heard of meditation, even though I didn't know what meditation was. And, uh, and what I found myself doing was just at the end of my workout. So a workout routine has been a big part of 25 years for me, a couple hours, usually each morning, each day. And after working out, like usually go in the sauna and in the sauna, I would, I started out like just doing some breathing exercises and closing my eyes. And that was the meditation. And I remember someone coming into the sauna and being like, where'd you learn how to meditate? And I said, I don't even know. I just, I was just kind of, I thought that's what you do, right? You close your eyes and you, and, and, uh, and he said, Oh, you got to check out this book on meditation. And, um, that kind of led down the path, but really a game changer for me was I took a workshop, I guess about 12, 14 years ago now, um, uh, Baba G Kriya Yoga, uh, which teaches uh, over a weekend, teaches some, some, uh, uh, forms of yoga, but also breathing exercises and, a, a meditation exercise, uh, and I've been now doing that for over a decade as part of my normal workout. Um, and, uh, and it, it's, um, I've been, I've done so many reps of it that I can sh generally shed away my feelings of my body and what, what's going on in my mind and even the emotional, uh, signals and just tap into my true spiritual self and, um, uh, and then, and then kind of bring that back into everything I'm doing after that throughout the day. It's so refreshing to hear somebody talk about working out and reps when it has to do with the mental state versus just the physical state. Um, so that's really refreshing. We had somebody ask a question here before we get to the last one uh, centered around tips, lessons, wisdom, and advice. And that question for you is, how has fatherhood influenced your work with companies you mentor or invest in? I like that question. Um, as a single dad, I like that question. I, you know, I've been always a, uh, a servant leader. I've learned a lot about servant leadership, but I've always felt that I naturally came from uh, being a servant leader, meaning that, you know, I'm at the bottom of the uh, triangle and I'm empowering my team members to be their best self, to personally grow, to professionally grow, show them how to do that and give them the the tools. And that's what we do as parents. And so when I became a, a parent, um, it just intensified my my servant leadership. And And I say, Becoming a parent made me a better entrepreneur, and being a servant leader made me a better parent. Um, and and it be, it's become over the last my kids are thirteen and eleven, um, uh, just just a stronger and stronger cycle. And so I, I generally just always show up, looking to help other people out, looking for the best in them, trying to understand where they are in their journey, and and then offer them my thoughts on like what what a potential next steps could look like given my experience and. And, uh, and that's, that's all I, that's what I bring to, uh, that's what I bring to my portfolio companies or, or really anyone that I have a opportunity to one-on-one -on -one mentor with. Awesome. And what that brings up is, so it's in, for those listening, if you didn't know in Canada, June is uh, national indigenous history month. 
And there's often a misnomer about totem poles and that saying, oh, you bottom of a totem pole. But in actuality, in their culture, the bottom of the totem pole is exactly what you said. It's the foundation. It's the base. It's like the, the elder, the servant leader. So that's, that's anyway, what came up a little bit and what you were saying there. So that's interesting. Um, all right, Mike. So last question for you centered around tips, lessons, wisdom, advice. We normally tell people some aren't comfortable answering this from the position of giving advice, but you know, that's what you do as a mentor. You have the success and the track record to do so. So. It's also important to note that people listening are going to be entrepreneurs. They got this nine to five. They want to do this passion so that they might be listening. Other people, as you know, who've been on the show are going to be listening. So they're the founders already in their own business, but you're speaking to a wide swath of people. So it's kind of an open ended question about lessons, tips, wisdom, and advice. Yeah, I think um, we need a plan, right? Uh, we're, we all want to grow. Um, we're all going to grow until the day that we die personally. And and if we're in business or even if we're in a career working for someone, we we, we want to grow. Uh, that's 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 in our nature. So you got to have a plan to grow. You got to have a roadmap. And uh, I just have found over the years, the more that you simplify that to be your North Star, your your guidepost, how, however you think about it, the, it, the better it's going to be. So specifically what I'm talking about is very much like a business needs to have a mission statement and the, and the business needs to be focused around its mission statement. I believe you need to have a personal mission statement of what you're going to bring to this world and, and put that down in a sentence or two and, and refine the words in that sentence until it really resonates and, and, and feels good just as much for you, for you personally as your business. And if you're, even if you're in business, you always have to, and, and personally have to check and readjust that mission statement. From there, it's having and and defining your core values and being very clear on your core values. Um, and again, maybe a handful or two of of things, a couple words that really define how you're going to operate personally or for your family, uh, or and for sure while you're in business and how the business and and the group of people are going to operate. Those two things um, done well really set you up for doing a SWOT analysis, strengths and weaknesses uh, of, of yourself personally. Um, you know, and I use my example, I'm a, I'm a natural finance person, I think, cause my mom was an accountant and I think I have that, some of that genetically, but she also taught me some things, but you know, sales and marketing, I had to learn that. And it was, it was such a struggle for me for so many years, but knowing that I could make sure that I had sales and marketing resources and support uh, around me. So, but doing that personally, whatever, whatever your SWOT is or your strength and weaknesses, and, and then doing that through business, those things then give you some clarity around what's the growth, what's the growth drivers for you, um, growth drivers for you personally. And then, and then the same could be true for your, for your business. But, you know, I don't think a lot of enough people like, you know, we, when we're younger, we have these goals and objectives. I want to finish school. I want to get this job. Like, you know, there's somewhat destinations, but what I've learned is it not, you know, it's never about the end of the journey. It's all about milestones through it because it's a continuous journey. So you constantly have to be, um, detailing your plan and then checking in, revising your plan. And if you simplify that mission values, SWOT analysis, and, and, and then your growth drivers, you're going to be so much better off. To the point where, and I share this so much with people, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think about how, you know, whether I do a little course or something that makes it highly simple, because I've seen the impact on people when they just start putting, putting their muscle to a clear growth plan for them personally, and then for sure for businesses, um, what the impact is. Well, I think for a lot of people listening, not only the fact that you touched on creating the mission, you know, vision values and the SWOT analysis, but even more powerful was how you describe not only like being okay with changing it but that that is completely necessary because i think a lot of people might do something and then think oh geez what happens if i change it you know it's but you're saying no well yeah it's scary it's yeah and it's scary to change it don't get me wrong like hey the, the, when pe some people believe don't tell people your growth plan uh which I, i'm i'm a more transparent leader so i want to tell everyone my personal growth plan and my business growth plan to get more in the community but some people say don't tell people because it is scary and we do need to change it. We do constantly need to check and readjust and change. But what happens when we change too much as an individual? We get scared that people get freaked out. You know, we could lose friends, we could lose community because we're 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 changing and uh, and that's scary. So then we we pull that closer to our chest and and but that usually slows down the uh, the growth. So you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in um, let yesterday die be the change today, like have your clear plan. But if your plan changes and I, you know, growing a business from 
from zero to a hundred million dollars and taking myself from a 300 pound overweight person that smokes cigarettes to more healthy and, and athletic and thinking about getting to hundred years old, like that mass amount of change only happened because I had a clear plan. And then I let yesterday die constantly, you know, it's, it's over, we can't do anything about it. And so don't worry if you, tomorrow you, 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 you don't worry if you said you wanted to be an entrepreneur, you tried it for two years and you're like, you know what, for my best day ever in my lifestyle, I want to, I want to be a number two for someone. I want to work at a great business because that'll afford everything or vice versa to that. Like you, you, you can change that and and not have the fear of you were doing anything, but um, nibbling at it and seeing if you're going to expand your palate in that area. And if not uh, let it go. Well, everybody, Mike talked about Grow. So his book is called Grow, 12 Unconventional Lessons for Becoming an Unstoppable Entrepreneur. And I'm just going to put this out there. I think your second book is going to be called yes, uh, Let Yesterday Die. That's just me. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, so is there anything, Mike, that came up in our conversation that maybe you missed or you want to double back on or any announcements or anything that you have? No, I just think, and, 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 I'm, and I'm out there. So I would just put it out. I, I, I'd make it as an invitation, but you know, I like to connect with as many people as possible, especially people that are making this world a healthier place. Um, and so, you know, hopefully you touch in uh, like selfishly, I'm going to say, yeah, buy my book, but I think it's a great product and people can learn from it, but there's a bunch of tools, whether it's the the podcast or my unstoppable entrepreneur newsletter, or just connecting with me on social that don't cost anything. And, and I would encourage you to do that. I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn and, and just like to engage with the community and, and help people out as much as I can. Wonderful. Thank you. So you can find Mike on LinkedIn, Mike Fata. His website is www.mikefata.ca. We talked about Fata and Fleischman as a website, as a resource, put that in the show notes. Uh, his podcast for uh, founder to mentor podcast and you can find him on instagram at the mike fata so everybody this has been an amazing conversation with the ceo of fat and associates mike fata thank you so much for joining us mike everybody thank you so much for listening and we'll catch you soon on another episode of edge networking canada take care bye for now